We're about to begin, and with that comes introductions of our next Empower Commission. Lieutenant Governor Brent Sanford will be our moderator for this panel, and I'm just going to provide a brief introduction of him. He was elected in 2016, and he brings a strong background in business and finance to this office, coupled with a deep understanding of the importance of local control and the need to keep property taxes low. As Lieutenant Governor, Sanford serves as President of the State Senate, leads the North Dakota Trade Office, and chairs several boards and commissions. Today he will be the moderator for a panel representing the Empower Commission. Welcome Lieutenant Governor Sanford. Thank you, Jason. And I've got to add to that resume on our website that I'm now an ex-officio member of Empower Commission. So that's a exciting part of my job that's been added, very relevant to my past. Um, uh, I would like to share some remarks before we get in to the panel. Uh, I'd like to tell you, yesterday I, was, I happened to be in Washington, D.C. for a Royalty Policy Committee meeting uh, in the Department of Interior. And it's interesting the difference between administrations on attitude towards energy, coal, gas, and oil especially. Uh, the, the undersecretary that led off the meeting basically said the president will, will, the president will accept nothing less than energy dominance from the United States of America, and so that's what's in front of us today, is how do we do that? How do we help in the federal lands portfolio? How do we reverse the trend of going from $18 billion of, for example, $18 billion of offshore drilling revenue from federal leases in 2008 to $2 billion today? We, they're, they're looking at reversing that trend of protecting the environment, protecting the air and water, as we're all in the clean water and air team, but also managing these federal lands appropriately, responsibly for the taxpayer. So it was a very good meeting. Um, coal leases came up quite often, um, so there's, there's a lot of work to do. A lot of expertise here in the room can help on that. But um, as well as that, um, very grateful to see so many people here today and interest in this this esteemed group. Um, this is evidence that the lignite industry and energy sector in general are alive and well. Uh, we're in re reinvigorated by the new administration, as I mentioned. It's put some wind at our backs instead of our faces. When Senator Hoven first came up with Empower in 2001, it was a great vision to get everyone on the same page for the all the above approach to energy development, assembling voices from all aspects of the state's energy resources. And then the 2007 legislature advanced that vision with the Empower Commission. Those actions have paid huge dividends. Congratulations to all of you here who have played a role in the growth of our energy industry, helping to position North Dakota as an energy leader. We're now ranked sixth in the nation for energy production, behind Texas, Wyoming, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Oklahoma, up from 23rd in 2007. And we've achieved that success through an all-the-above energy strategy with Lignite as our base load function, foundation. And the future is bright. Through R&D, such as what was discussed at the last panel, we're ready to launch the next phase of North Dakota energy production. Improved carbon capture and enhanced oil recovery techniques have the potential to significantly reduce emissions and also recover millions, possibly billions, of more barrels of oil. Uh, and to note, last month, the Industrial Commission committed more than $5 million from the Lignite Research Fund for Project Carbon to identify and reduce barriers relating to post-combustion capture of carbon dioxide from existing lignite-based power plant. Um, EERC is leading the 14-month study um, looking at cleaner lignite technology and whether CO2 can boost output in our oil fields. Uh, innovation in the development of new technologies have been and will continue to be the success to the North Dakota's energy industries. As the governor always likes to say, the goal is innovation, not regulation, and he means it. Our administration means that, and it appears it's the same way in the federal government today. We also know that a stable regulatory environment is important to long-term viability for North Dakota's coal industry. At the federal level, the White House is giving us a break from the overburdensome, overreaching regulations of the previous, but there is no guarantee that it will last. Now is the time to embrace our all-the-above approach and position North Dakota as a net energy exporter, helping our nation become not just energy independent, but energy dominant. There's an estimated 1.1 trillion of proven coal reserves worldwide. This means there's enough coal to last us around 150 years at current rates of production. In contrast, proven oil and gas reserves are more like 50. So a path forward for coal will provide us with energy security and reliability for generations to come. 
Next, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have, I shouldn't need notes, but we have Jay Scable from MDU. We have Stacy Dahl from Minkota. We have Justin Dever from Commerce, Ron Ness from Oil and Gas, Dale Nishvog from Basin, Jason Bohr from Lignite Council. We look to have a very robust conversation. Uh, we're putting ourselves in the hot seat here. Um, we're going to conduct a little self-examination and then, and then hopefully there's questions from the audience. I led one of these at the kickoff for the Petroleum Conference last week and, and we left room for questions and went over, so, so hopefully this is uh, something you'll have questions. Um, but um, we basically have three questions that we've been tasked with. Number, with number one is what is the role of the Empower Commission, the new administration? Number two, what can we expect different from the past? Number three, how should Governor Burgum use the Empower Commission to benefit North Dakota? So uh, the first question, what is the role of the Empower Commission in the new administration? That seems like that would be a question for me, so I'll go first. Uh, I'd like to tell you that Governor Burgum is, is very excited about the future of energy in North Dakota, all components of it, from oil and gas to lignite coal to wind, solar, and ethanol. And he's, he's been challenging the industries to keep innovating and raising the bar to keep North Dakota at the forefront in the national energy picture. Um, as evidenced by a couple of goals last week for Petroleum Conference that were that were questioned is can we get there, but these are aspirational goals to go from 1 million to 2 million barrels a day, to go to zero pipeline spills. I mean, these are, these are aspirational goals to try to shoot for and look at the reasons of why couldn't we do that. Um, but Governor Burgum looks to the Empower Commission as the, basically as the think tank for consensus building, for energy policy for the state, infrastructure development, and collaborating on technology. Um, so, um, actually, I'm going to go off script a little here. The next question, I'm going to answer that one as well because I think it's direct bearing on our office. What, um, and I know this is a question a lot of people have had about Empower Commission from the board itself and from those in, in the industries, but what can we expect different from the administration than from in the past? And I would have to tell you one of the, one of the things where we're putting our money where our mouth is is, is the amount of time that, that I'm being asked to devote to the Ener Empower Commission and the energy sector itself. And with my background as a public official in the Bakken, advocating for the West, advocating for Western energy counties um, at the legislature over the years, seeing what happened with the energy boom in the Bakken, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of correlation to what happens in coal country and oil country. And I'm, I'm very excited about being able to help, to help define the vision for Empower going forward, help driving those initiatives, fostering collaboration between industries, and, and being able to bridge the gap from our administration to the Empower and out to the industries. So. Um, um, first question from the panel, I'd um, like to ask the various industries that represented here what your opinions are of how should Governor Burgum use the Empower Commission to benefit North Dakota? Is there anyone that wants to go first? Dale? Jason? I guess I reached, Dale. For, the, I reached for the mic first, so I guess it puts me up first. I think the governor, what he needs to do is, is, is use the, the Empower Commission as it was originally set up for. The, what happened in the early years was that the legislators, and I think through part of the governor's office, got really tired of all the different energy uh, entities coming in with, with bills, going in front of a committee, and then having arguments between the different forces. So you sometimes you'd have Oil and gas would come in with a proposal that Lignite didn't like. Ethanol would come in with a proposal someone else didn't like. And all of a sudden, we'd be having these arguments in front of a committee and wasting a lot of the legislators' time and putting them kind of in the hot seat of having to choose one over the other. So the idea of the commission was, let's get everybody together in a room before the session starts and have those conversations and have those debates before we get in front of a, a legislative committee to try and come back with a, with a proposal that has been vetted, that people have understood and maybe compromised on. So you take a lot of that time out of the session and put it into pre-session and get some better decisions made. And I think for a large extent that has worked very well. It has come, and not without growing pains, we've had a lot of situations where Either at times we, we didn't flush out ideas as well as we should have. We had, sometimes we got too far ahead and had legislation proposed and some people thought we were going too far at that point. But the idea of getting the groups, getting the energy groups together, having debates, coming up with hopefully 
a conclusion or a position that can work forward that helps the state, helps the industry and moves along is still, I think, a good process and we just keep refining it as we go. And I think that if the governor can use that for uh, as it was set up for, it just makes life easier and moves the state forward quicker. Thanks, Dale. Jay? Yeah, I think it goes in a, a step beyond that uh, with the new administration. I think they're pushing for, they being you, uh, collaboration on new projects, uh, projects where we can actually work together, uh, get projects that work across uh, the industries and have those industries coordinate, collaborate, and advance some of the new projects that will bring new jobs to the state, new wealth, use the, all of the existing resources that we have in new manners and uh, bring additional wealth and success to the state. I would also say that you can see just in the, in the recent past that it's also been used to kind of solve and provide input on specific issues. You know, the, a lot of work that members of the Empower Commission have put on um, trying to figure out ways to inform the conversation about electricity markets. A specific problem that um, needs some additional thought and a specific challenge from the governor to say, um, you all get in the room and, and let's get more information available so we can make better decisions. Ron, any thoughts? Ron Ness? I know you've talked in the past about, you gave me a good history lesson on ethanol versus the, versus the traditional fossil fuel, oil and gas. Sure, and, and you know, the initial, the initial uh, one of the initial topics was the squabbles between ethanol and, and oil and gas and uh, over mandates and things like that. And uh, ultimately what we decided through Empower was that really when we took that mandate off the table, everything else we had was in common. And if we raise the economy the threshold of the economy of North Dakota, you can sell more ethanol and still sell more, more of your petroleum products because it was getting to be a heart conflict there. And, and we did that. And when, when I think back to Empower, uh, one of the first goals that we had was to double the, double the energy production of North Dakota. And we have doubled that and, and well beyond that. And in fact, I, I saw a report earlier this morning that our nation for the first time has zero net imports of oil in the last reporting period. Think about that. Zero net imports of oil. That, that should be front page news everywhere. So we exported as much oil as we imported in the last reporting period. Now our, our, our economic, because of the hurricanes and things, our economics were down a little bit and, and consumption was down, but how, how many of you saw a huge price of in, in the cost of gasoline because we couldn't import oil into the Gulf Coast refineries. And if, if we think back to Katrina, that was a huge, huge impact on what we all paid. So it's a huge savings to all of Americans and it's really not getting the type of acknowledgement or front page news, certainly, that, that I think it should. But w when I look at Empower today and, and I see the governor engaged and the lieutenant governor at the table, my thoughts are that we should really begin to push the envelope from an empower group that we need to be that think tank you discussed and we need to we need to be visionary and we need to think big and and not kind of back into a circle of of this things we know are safe and we can advance that are going to be successful we need to push the envelope we're going to win some we're going to lose some but much like the governor's goal of two million barrels a day it was a goal just like we had the goal of in doubling our energy production in north dakota we all thought it was a little bit crazy at the time but guess what uh that's way back somewhere we're well beyond that, so I, I, I encourage us to think big, uh, roll the dice a little bit, and get some things done because we got to move ahead. So, Ron, when we were producing 30,000 barrels a day, was there a goal to get to a million? Uh, absolutely not. We, we never even, we, we looked at the, the all-time record of oil production in North Dakota was 154,000 barrels a day in, in 1982, I believe, and that just seemed like so far off, we were, we were around 83,000 barrels a day in 2004, 2002. And if you would have set a goal of 200,000 barrels a day, I think we would have all kind of giggled. And, and look where we are today. And it's, it's all about technology. It's all about uh, advancing the ball, thinking big. And we achieved that. Stacy. 
I will just add, I'm one of the newest appointees to the Empower Commission, but I also have a, a background as a state legislator. So I think one of uh, the, the issues that the, the, this group has to work on is staying in balance with our lawmakers and not getting out too far ahead as Dale made reference to, because at the end of the day, we have to build support from the governor's office, from the commission, from the legislature, as well as public support. So it really is a balancing act um, in terms of making sure we all stay on the same page. And I would also say we need to be bold and visionary, uh, but we also have to have the capacity to drill down into some very complicated issues as well. So it's, it's both very detailed and very broad. Before we get Justin in here, I'm going to ask Dale to jump into our, our uh, 101 presentation. Speaking of, Stacy brought up the, the, uh, the point, but what we've been working on in Empower for the last few months is, is uh, and it's not to be offensive to anyone like me, but I mean, it's, it's basically the fact that besides people that are in the industry, there's not a lot of awareness of MISO and SPP and the whole thing of how power is actually sold and how it actually gets into our homes. And, and I can say from my standpoint, as someone lived in the West, not completely aware of how all that works, and I think it's fair to say and not offensive to say that legislators, especially newer legislators, are not going to be as averse to all that. And so, so part of not understanding the entire process of electricity, of how it's generated, sold, ends up in our house, um, can contribute to some of the arguments that we saw during the last legislative session. And so this group has been involved in putting, get, putting together a 101 presentation for, for one of the energy subcommittees for legislative uh, interim. And uh, Dale would go into that a little further. I appreciate it. Well, the, the issue came up. It's, and that's one thing nice about the Empower is, is you get the natural conflicts between energies that are out there. And this, the Empower Commission gives you a forum to work through them. Um, ethanol and petroleum, they were in the barrel. Now it's been wind and, wind and coal that have kind of been in the barrel last session. And as we went through that, there's, there's the natural tendency of the legislatures have been incredibly supportive of coal all through the years. And that, and that support has not wavered at all. And so the perception is out there that with all the wind energy coming in, that's going to force coal out. We want to do what we can to, to prop up, not I want to say prop up, but support coal as we're going forward. And so there were several initiatives that came forward that in very well intentioned, but in the end didn't achieve what they wanted to do. So as we went through that process, we realized that there's a new, in, there's a new paradigm shift in our in industry where we used to have our generator, we had our transmission lines going to our, our customers. And that all changed in the last 10 years where we joined regional transmission organizations. So, all of a sudden, instead of having our power going to our customers, we are now selling generation into a pool, and then we are buying power cereals out of that pool. And so it's a huge concept that's, that's, you know, we live the world and it's hard to keep up with and understand. And so we're getting there with legislators and different committees and the administration trying to get them to get their heads wrapped around it as well. So we just figured out that we needed to kind of go to a basic premise so that everyone's got a basic level of understanding. So we came up with the idea of let's do a Generation 101 and talk about how we work now as utilities with our generators, how wind energy comes into that, how natural gas energy comes into that, how it's bought and sold in the market. And there are, a, there are situations that are, that are coming up with where you've only got so much load out there and when you bring in new generation, that means that some generation is going to run less, some will run more. And so getting the legislature to understand, here's how the process works, so if they want to come up with a change to do that, then they have a better understanding of what questions to ask. So we're starting at that basic level, then hopefully bring in some of the uh, RTOs, the uh, Southwest Power Pool, and MISO to kind of talk about how they operate and just give everybody a better understanding so they can ask better questions and in the end make better policy. Thank you, Dale. Justin, commerce perspective. So I, I agree with a lot have, that has been said already as far as, as using Empower as a think tank and, and as far as looking at issues that impact more than one energy industry. So looking at ways to find solutions that, uh, that impact coal, that impact oil, that impact 
renewables as well and, and trying to find those solutions. And another important point I think is, as Dale had mentioned, uh, sometimes there's conflict. And I think that this conflict can be worked out ahead of time instead of taking it to the legislature. And then when it does get to the legislature, have some solutions that you can, can provide. Could you go through our um, policy, our subcommittee structure? That's something that Justin oversees from the Commerce Department, and we're basically dividing up an Empower Commission with different marching orders going forward in the interim. Uh, sure. So uh, this interim, uh, the Empower North Dakota Commission is going to have uh, three subcommittees that are put up. One is is dealing with policy. Uh, Dale had mentioned the uh, Energy 101 looking at, at that, the educational component, and then also looking at uh, potential solutions, uh, looking at the uh, Department of Energy recently had a staff report, uh, looking at resiliency uh, of the uh, electric markets. Uh, so looking at those recommendations, are there any of those, any of those recommendations that the uh, state could uh, be supportive of? Uh, another subcommittee is research and development, so looking at, at what can the state do to support research and development in all of the energy industries uh, in the state. And the uh, final subcommittee is infrastructure, looking at, at transmission infrastructure, at pipelines, electric transmission, and issues surrounding that and what can the state do to, uh, to help uh, improve the transmission infrastructure uh, in the state and, and out, out to other markets. Thank you. Any more to add on that one? Jay? Yeah, I can add a little bit. Um, you know, it's, it, a lot of the things that have been discussed so far have been where we've had conflicts between industries and trying to work to resolve those and we do spend a, a fair amount of time working through those and educating each other and and uh, coming to a compromise out of the group but there's also been several issues where everybody has concerns and we've pushed those forward uh, one of them that was uh, brought up at the last uh, the last meeting was the workforce. We used to have a workforce subcommittee, and that was a, an issue that everybody was having workforce uh, issues because we couldn't get enough folks up here. And that was something we could all agree on from the very beginning, and it was something that helped everybody in every industry, every company. And so I just want to make it kind of clear that we're, it's not all compromise and, and uh, uh, contentious issues. There's a lot of things that we work on that benefit the, the entire group and, and the entire state. Yeah, and I could, I could add one more um, example of that too. A couple, maybe it was just last year when the Waters of the United States rulemaking was proposed, um, we were able to use kind of that combined force of the Empower Commission to submit comments in opposition to that. Um, and it was one of the most persuasive statements from a state entity um, because it was a combined statement from all of the energy producers and users and interests in the state of North Dakota. And it was united, and it was because, as, as Jay mentions, we had the infrastructure in place to seek uh, common ground. And I think th to that same point, Empower forces us to may at least confront the difficult choices first um, and try and find consensus. It's a lot easier to fight over pieces of pie than it is to work together to make that pie bigger. That's when everybody wins, and I don't know that that's possible 100% of the time. We're, we're hoping it is, but it might not be, but at least it forces us to begin there. Yep. We're talking about concepts like is the, can the pie be, the size of the pie be increased if you're adding more wind resources into the mix of the transmission system we have, and, and, and how much is that how much is reasonable, how much can the whole system wide absorb. And so these conversations are happening. Um, and one thing that I find interesting is that most of, the, most of the companies have a tie to all the different types. They've got renewables and they've got base load. And so, so you really have the conversation happening within the companies themselves as well. And that, so that, that, to get that kind of communication out, I think helps, helps with the conversation in general. I want to touch back on the workforce initiative idea. Um, thank you, Jay. I didn't even have to prompt this, but we got one of the pillars of the Governor's Main Street Initiative, Workforce Development, brought up on, on the panel. And it's something that we uh, brought in as potentially bringing back that subcommittee for the interim at the last, in, the last Empower Commission meeting, is how important is workforce development, workforce recruitment, workforce retention to 
to the industries that are represented on the Empower Commission. And we obviously know the challenges oil and gas have had. I can tell you from, from uh, living in Watford City, there are still hundreds of job openings in oil and gas. But um, what we're seeing in, in the coal industry, in the power generation industry, is, is, um, is not to that degree. I, I know there, was, there were challenges hiring when the oil boom was happening, and now it's leveled off a bit. But we still have issues of, of retirements. Dale threw out a quite high number of retirements that are coming their way. And, um, are there, and, and so to tie it back, the Main Street Initiative is where do you have concerns about energy employees living close to where those, those facilities are versus the, the, the commute times that we're getting more and more comfortable with of 75 miles, 100 miles, and such. So I'd like to ask Dale to, to go into that of, of what, what the uh, retirements are looking like, your future workforce needs, any conversation to that effect? Well, as like I think most of the power plants and coal mines in North Dakota, you've got that group that came in in the uh, late 70s, early 80s when we were doing a lot of construction, a lot of plants coming on, and they came in and helped build the plants and ended up staying and, and spent their 30-year, their, their 40-year 40 career at the plant living in the town. And we've had this situation going on for about the past five years. It's going to continue on for the next five years of losing, or not, uh, losing probably anywhere between uh, 80 to 120 people a year just due to natural retirement. So as you get to that point, and you've got those people that have been in the community, they started the community, they, they've been very active in the community, and getting a retirement age, so then you've got a new crop of employees coming in, and, and I don't know the exact number, but you've got a lot of people that, that will, you know, don't mind living in Bismarck and making that, that commute and going back and forth. So the idea is, too, is, is, is how do you keep a core group, at least in, in those cities and out there working, and get to the at the point where they want to be out and live in in those in those communities and be a part of them and keep that tradition going. So that's something that you know from our standpoint, we just want to make sure that we're bringing in a good crop of employees to replace all of that knowledge and all the talent that we're losing. So we're looking at recruitment and retainment and getting the good employees that are there. The communities themselves, I think, are going to start start taking a look at okay, how do we get make sure that we get. It's those employees that want to stay in the community and be part of what we're doing out here. Yeah. And so um, from commerce perspective, basically that's where the governor's initiative, a Main Street initiative, and workforce development of one specific part of that comes into play with teaming up with industry. In this case, there are jobs. In other communities we go across the state, there are not jobs. And so there's an economic development component of it as well. But in this case, the jobs are there, the communities are there, are solid communities, but it's something where, where the communities wish or the, the, the employers' wishes need to be known as part of that partnership as well. So, Justin, if you want to allude to, sure, absolutely. So, at the Department of Commerce, we have the uh, the Workforce Development Division, which is really tasked with looking at the state's workforce training, workforce development um, uh, strategy, and and how all the pieces work together. We certainly work with job service. We work with. Uh, uh, career and technical education and work with others on how do we meet those those needs. Uh, we also have a workforce development council uh, similar to Empower in that it's comprised of private sector uh, of people that are, are in this day in and day out. And as, as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, also the Main Street Initiative is another uh, key part of this is helping the communities develop in such a way that they are attractive, that they are livable communities that people want to live in, that people are willing to move from outside the area in, into the uh, state, into these communities to uh, fill these, these wonderful opportunities. Um, if, if you look at the jobs that, that we have now and that we expect to have in the near future, we don't have the population in the state to fill all of these jobs. And we're going to have to be uh, able to attract them if we're going to uh, continue to be successful economically. Thank you. Jason? So at my first board meeting uh, that I ever attended for Lignite Council, we went around the table and asked every CEO, after regulations, what's your biggest challenge? And, and to a man, that was workforce. Um, and this was uh, fall of 2013. Um, so it's important to our industry. And uh, we talked about it again yesterday. Uh, so it hasn't gone away, it's decreased a little bit, but uh, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this, but Dan Dorfschmidt made a, a great point yesterday in our board meeting on the workforce issues and why it's important that we work with the state, commerce, everybody to understand those, because he said, you know, you can get into a situation where you're essentially just buying labor, 
and, and that's all it is. If you raise a salary high enough, you're going to bring somebody in um, from wherever, whatever part of the United States they're from. And when they're done there, and they, if all they're chasing is salary, they're going to move on when they're done. The, way, the more we understand the workforce issue, instead of recruiting somebody who only cares about one number from some other part of the country, maybe we, we, we understand the assets that we have and you bring somebody in who says, I didn't even know there was an opportunity back in my hometown that would provide me the quality of life that I would love to be, you know, love there, live there for the next 10, 15, 20 years. And it, it's about understanding what we have to offer and what people are actually looking for um, it goes back to that gathering information phase. The more information you have, the better policies and, and uh, outcomes you can get. Ron? Brett, I'm going uh, to change directions a little bit here. And um, over the last, prior to the last session, the Empower Commission started talking about changes at the Department of Health and, and what we were seeing in terms of focus of the agency and struggling for budgets and um, we came up with the concept of really creating a standalone Department of Environmental Quality. Senator Unruh is here and uh, thank you. She took, the, uh, she took the lead, she took the bull by the reins and, and we got that through the legislature. The new governor embraced it and I think it's going to be one of the great changes that we see going forward. But, you know, maybe one of the things that we can talk about is We've either got three or five years here where we think we've got a window in order to change the narrative on, on the perception of our industries, the support for our industries, or the t tenor of which uh, we're going to be regulated and, and obstructed under. And so as a state, you were in Washington yesterday in the Department of Interior. Um, we didn't get into the Department of Interior over the last eight years, and much alone get a meeting with them. So what are we going to do as a state to ensure that the whole paradigm that we're under today doesn't just flip the other direction in three years or seven years or whatever number of years? Because I think that's, that's kind of where we're headed today, is that things are good, 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 and then all of a sudden it's going to be bad, 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 bad. So as a state, can we use our DEQ? Can we use, use our Department of Environmental um, mineral resources, three-affiliated tribe wants more, more primacy over their regulations uh, from under the BIA and, and Interior and Forest Service and BLM. So as a state that we all think that, I think most of North Dakotans think that by and large we do a very good job of regulating, permitting, uh, protection of our uh, land mineral resources, all of those things. Can we begin pushing the envelope as a state to ensure that we can bring more of those things back here without the ability to just flip them the other direction in the, in the very near future. And what are we going to do in terms of communication? Uh, that is a big challenge, I think, for all of us. Uh, we can educate people across North Dakota to be with us, but that, that doesn't mean, uh, that doesn't get us 50 votes anywhere in the U.S. Senate. So what are we going to do on communication? What are we going to do to ensure that our state uh, assumes more uh, environmental regulatory responsibilities? And that's just not a, something that can be taken away from us uh, on any given day when an election goes the other way. So uh, I don't know what your industries are doing about that, Jason, and I don't know if that, that's maybe an empower topic for the future. I think Ron should have been put on policy committee instead of R&D. <laughs> but that is something to bring to empower, is what our combined voice is when we go to these meetings of Interior, because primacy on environmental came up, NEPA came up. Do you really want primacy if you have to administer NEPA? Can we get exclusions to NEPA, and then we can, and then we can have primacy on the issues and not have to do full-blown NEPA so we can have don't have to have that 180 days on top of a permit. I mean, these are big questions, and they want to know the answer. But those answer. are things that we have to plan well in advance for. You just don't immediately say, oh, yeah, we're going to do NEPA. You have to have an agency that's fully capable. Yep. We, we set that up with the Department of Environmental Quality now, but we have to be thinking ahead to what they may need, or else we're going to uh, we're going to miss our window. Yep. And I'll follow the tag team on that a little bit with what we're looking at, and we're doing that same review now, going, we do have that window, and how do we make that happen? And the big thing that, you know, I'm sure everyone in this auditorium got beat to death with, death with was a clean power plan. Mm -hmm. 
And so now we've got a chance where the EPA is pulling that back. I know internally we're looking at how can, what, what, is the, what would a new carbon management plan, it's not a, re, not a clean power plan rewrite, it is a carbon management plan because we're still going to have to do something. Even though the current plan is not going to be there, we got to come up with something. So internally we're talking about what should that look like. We're also working with regional co-ops, working with Minn Kota, working with uh, Great River Energy, trying to, again, solidify a position, working with our national organization, but under that same auspices that we need to do something now so that a new administration come, doesn't come in and just rewrite it. A big part of that is going to be the state, at least from a, uh, a plant position where you've got to say, on the carbon management plan, here's what we think should be done, the state is going to have to approve it. So we've got to have that close working relationship, which we have enjoyed all through the years. So with the new administration, you, you look at all the challenges that are coming. I mean, for so many years from a coal plant, we were simply worried about, okay, what is the next environmental regulation that we have to meet? What's the next piece of technology we got to hang on a plant or what, how's the next operating uh, standard going to be different? Uh, one of the things that was interesting when we were meeting with uh, the Governor Burgum as a candidate, he came in and we met at the Lake Energy Council and he looked at what our R&D budget was. And he goes, you, that, your budget is woefully inadequate for, 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 change, for a changing industry. And we said, well, you're exactly right. All we've worried about is how do we handle the next fix? We've never looked at transforming our industry. And so he was, he was hitting on something that we were just starting to, to become aware of and start to move on. And so as far as another standpoint of the administration, besides having to work together on new, new regulatory plans on the federal level, is how do we move the, move the industry forward? And you heard just in the last panel talking about the projects that are out there, Project Tundra, putting something on the back end of an existing plant to make it better. You heard about Alum Cycle coming, about coming in with a new technology to, to generate electricity using Lignite. If we're gonna move those projects forward, and I think Tundra, as, as well as Alum, we're talking hundreds of millions to billions of dollars of projects. And we're gonna get industry support, at this point hope to get federal support, but we're also gonna need state support on that. So using the NPower Group as a sounding board, as an education board to bring that forward is a big part of what we're doing, but we're in a, a really exciting time from the energy industry from eight years, 10 years of doom and gloom to all of a sudden we've got a chance to do something. We understand that it's a narrow window and can we get it all done, but it's gonna take groups like the Empower Commission working together and working with the state, but having the state right at that table, listening to it helps move things a lot quicker. If, if I could just supplement what Dale said, I remember that meeting he referenced with, um, I think this was shortly after the primary, um, when Doug Burgum had been uh, formally endorsed by the party. Uh, so we had our first initial sit down and uh, I remember we were reviewing the gap between recovering our costs uh, on Tundra and Alum and the gap is significant, hundreds of millions. And so historically that is a huge ask uh, to the state of North Dakota. I uh, sat on the appropriations committee uh, when I was in the house, and I remember wrangling over fifty thousand dollars. So, so to be uh, making these asks is not something that's lost upon me or anybody within the industry. And I remember the governor's response was, "Your numbers don't phase me. I came from an industry where it was innovate or, or essentially get left in the dust. And I came from a company whose R and D budget was six billion dollars." per year because that's what it took uh, to stay in the game. So I think it is um, uh, a renewed vigor by this administration uh, with, a, with a real understanding of the intensive nature of these projects and uh, that is uh, very reassuring to the companies who are pursuing these projects. We have like 15 minutes left, and so I want to break in in case there's questions, please. They've got microphones going through the room. If there's questions, otherwise you can tell we, we can probably keep talking up here. So holler out if there's questions. You can't see very well, so you have to raise your hand. Just a uh, segue to Stacy's comment. And we, were in, we were in Grand Forks last week for our annual meeting, and, and we had a number of these similar discussions. And 
If you were to take the dollars that the state of North Dakota invested in, in, in today's dollar, what the state of North Dakota has invested into agriculture, the number would be staggering. I will absolutely guarantee you. But where would North Dakota agriculture be without that investment that was made into develop the new types and the new types of crops with the shorter growing season and, 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 and all of the things that you're seeing to be able to grow corn and soybeans here and um, the different wheat varieties and we, we've got to start looking at that. And frankly, we need to make that comparison because uh, energy is a new game in the state, and it's a big game. And if we want to get better, bigger, faster, stronger, we need to be, in the, be fully in the game. I have a question. Uh, it's not really a question. It's just kind of a comment. You guys were talking about bringing people into these towns near the plants in the area where a lot of the the newer generation, the millennial, wants to live in the bigger areas. And I don't know if you guys have ever thought about it, but even some of the plants, mines, oil field, if you would actually run a bus where it would have like Wi-Fi where they could sit on their cell phones and surf the web or do something as they're going to work or sleeping coming back, the quality of life they could see for that and the lower expenses for cars and mileage might be really uh, beneficial. So it's just a different look at it. Jay? No, that's, that's a very good idea. I, when we were back on the workforce topic, one of the things we're doing, it's, it's not that answer, but uh, particularly for in our small towns where we hire one or two folks to be our local lineman or troubleshooter, um, we really struggled to uh, get, get people to fill those positions and because those towns, a lot of them aren't even as big as Beulah or Hazen. Uh, and whereas the, uh, the power plants at Beulah and Hazen uh, do have the ability to ship some people back and forth, allow some people to live back in, in Bismarck and tra uh, commute, in those small towns, they, we don't have that ability. There has to be somebody there all the time. And one of the uh, uh, efforts we're looking into right now is hiring very young and local. So it's somebody that we know is interested in staying in Wishick or Bowman and training them to be a lineman, training them to do that distribution work and hoping still, there's still, you have to hope a little bit that they don't decide they want to move to Bismarck, but at least it's a, a, a lot more, a lot better chance that they'll stay in that small town than somebody that comes up from Louisiana just because there's a job and then they, they leave in a year or so. Yeah, Question. Brent, um, this is Dave Blair. I was just wondering with the Empower um, Commission, is ag at the table? Um, you know, an agricultural representative there at the table and would that make good sense to having somebody there at the table representing ag? Great question. Randy Schneider is on the board, and we, would, we didn't invite him today because he would have talked the whole time. But, but Randy, what Randy represents, and, and I can say that about him because I worked with him a long time ago at I'd Bailey, but Randy is, he's a tax accountant, but he's very, very passionate about value-add manufacturing, value-added egg manufacturing, and so we hear about soybean processing plants and sour, safflower processing plants and ethanol and I would assume Randy jumped on Empower from representing ethanol. Is that where? He's, he's in, and so he's, he's a very active member. So yes, that the egg value add is a topic at every meeting. Good question, thank you. Justin? I, I would add to that we also do have a specific agriculture representative on the, uh, on the Empower Commission as well. So, and, and we, have, we have a biodiesel. Uh, actually, that position is, completely, is currently vacant, but we have biodiesel on there in addition to ethanol. Uh, we have the whole range of energy industries that are in this state are represented on the Empower North Dakota Commission. It's a 19-member panel. Any more? All right. If there's no questions, we're probably going to let you go early to lunch. I don't think anybody's ever disappointed with that. Any, any closing comments from up here? All right. Thank you very much for your time. Have a great, have a great meeting.